The church is not the building. I am not a paid servant that works in the building to keep you happy. We, all of us, are the church. And if the building were to disappear all around us right now, and you were all suddenly sitting on the floor, and I was just standing on the grass and shouting at you, what I felt like God wanted me to say, you are the church. I want to talk a little bit about freedom today, and one of the things that's really important for us to recognize is that we kind of want to have absolute freedom. If you, if you know what I mean, absolute freedom sort of being that, uh, you know, the idea that you can do anything you want, whenever you want, however you want, all those sorts of things. But the problem is this, if you have absolute freedom, you will then be hit with absolute responsibility. And I was thinking about these, this idea that it sounds absolutely fantastic, and I, I, I've got a bunch of kids in my house that are, that are in the, the process of, of becoming 18. And I remember myself, now it wasn't that long ago that I turned 18, but I remember myself, some of the feelings that were going on in, in my mind when I was going to turn 18. And, and the idea of being free, to not have my parents oppressing me anymore, seemed like such a great idea. And while I was such a wonderful child and so well behaved and never had any kinds of issues, I'm sure that there was a certain amount they were looking forward to being free of me. But once you finally hit that magical adulthood, as they like to call it, you sometimes wish that you didn't have to make so many decisions. I've thought about this a little bit in relation to our faith, and one of the things that I think we sometimes overlook is that there is this in intense freedom that was enabled by Jesus himself. That if we had grown up as Jews and, and be able to be part of, the Isra of Israel and have our relationship with God, we would not necessarily see things exactly the same way we do now when somebody comes in and says, you know what, you don't have to follow all of these rules anymore. I was thinking about all the things that Jesus got in trouble for breaking the rules because he wasn't free to do whatever he wanted, even though he was God. So how does Jesus always get himself into trouble? You probably remember. He does all these things on the one day you're not supposed to do them. It seems like every time you turn the page, he's healing somebody on the Sabbath. I mean, come on, really? Working? Those people could wait to feel better till the next day, don't you think? We've heard all these times about how there were all of these laws. Laws were good. They, their intent was to help people to be able to, to relate to one another, to be able to relate with God. But when we get a little bit of an, an idea of a rule, sometimes we want to start drawing lines. And eventually, the Pharisees had drawn so many. Jesus comes. He says, I'm not here to abolish all that, but I'm here to fulfill it. And, and in doing so, he gives a bit of freedom. That the concept of the law is what's important, not the actual thing. Now, that's a little sermon within a sermon, so I hope you're keeping up. Because my question for us today is what is most important for us to consider when we exercise our Christian freedom? Now, here's the thing. If there is this law that, that kind of helps us to relate to one another and relate to God, we would know those primarily as the Ten Commandments, right? If there is this law and that within that we are free to do whatever we want to do, then perhaps one of the, the challenges here is that when we begin to become legalistic, we forget what God is getting after. And we forget what God is encouraging us to do. What must we consider the most when exercising Christian freedom is very important. What Jesus wants to change is all the legalistic interpretations where it becomes so silly that Jesus has the power and the ability to walk up to somebody on the Sabbath and say, get up and walk. And what they're angry about is not that somebody who'd never been able to walk before can now walk, but that it happened on a certain day. 
You see, sometimes we begin to do the same sorts of things in our Christian life. There, there's times when we live out this exact same sort of thing, and we forget that what we ought to be paying attention to is the freedom to work. The law just gives us a guidance on how that freedom, we're free to, to obey it. Follow what I'm saying? We're going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians again. We did last week, if you were here with us then. But it, it, in this particular case, it seems like the Corinthians were having a bit of a challenge. We talked a little bit last week of, uh, of this idea of wisdom, and they wanted you to be very smart. And Jesus says, you know, really, you, you should stop worrying, or Paul says, you should stop worrying about all of the the uh, intellects and worry more about Jesus. This week, we're going to look at another issue that they seem to be having, and that is some of these little rules about what exactly is okay and what is too far and what is not far enough, so to speak. And one of the challenges that they had was meat that was being sacrificed to idols being kind of prevalent in their society. Is it okay to eat meat and, and it might have been sacrificed to an idol, or is it not? It would be great if we had a letter, that the, the one that they probably sent him, that he's now responding to, so we had some more details, but we can kind of ascertain from what he says what he's talking about. And one of the biggest concerns they have about this whole thing about meat sacrificed to idols comes down to the idea of what do you do when you have weaker Christians or unbelievers, and then you have very strong Christians who understand that the rule about not doing something isn't always a rule. That there may be a very good reason, if it's relational, that we could kind of break it up and, and do something different. And that's what brings us today's, to, the, to today's passage. Some of you are probably familiar with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 31. It says this, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whatever you eat or whatever you drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, I know at this point you already understand exactly what he's saying, but I'm going to talk anyway, all right? Here's the first thing I want to kind of point out. Paul seems to acknowledge that, that there is a freedom. You have the freedom to exercise your rights in any way that you see fit, of course, within the law, within the rules, and, and obeying God, but none of that happens without a consequence. You cannot exercise your freedom without there being some sort of something happening on the other side. The challenge seems to come down to this this concept of on a personal level, you and I might see things completely differently, that is perfectly okay. It's perfectly wonderful. The challenge that we're facing in our society right now, if you haven't been paying attention, there's an election coming up in a couple of months, and in the meantime, people can't even seem to talk to one another unless they know they already agree. I was having a conversation with somebody, and we were trying to, to talk about some financial challenges that this person was having in their business, and they were being kind of like really unclear until they finally said, well, who do you support for president? And I was like, huh, that shouldn't have been one of the questions you had to ask. You see, the freedom to be able to disagree is one of the, the, the gifts that we have that we don't all have to follow the same rule because somebody said it was so. I've told you many times, I'm going to get up here and I'm going to preach and I'm going to tell you what I believe God is speaking to me through, through me to you, hopefully. But if you feel like there's anything not quite right in there, don't listen to me, listen to God. 
And that's important. But here's the thing. Freedom can strengthen your faith or it can weaken it. Freedom can build other people up or it can tear them down. Paul's trying to tell us this. He's saying, look, one of the key factors in whatever rights you want to exert is to make sure that you are considering others in your decisions. Don't just say, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And I want to be sure that we recognize, Paul's speaking specifically about how we relate to God, but also how we relate to others. And I think one of our challenges is that we have never moved past what the Corinthians are facing The church has been guilty many times of becoming legalistic and saying, well, this is how God says we ought to live. So we begin to to put specific rules and then sort of impose on other people's freedom to do what God's telling them to do. You see, we still are considering ourselves and exercising our rights sometimes in ways that show that we care more about us than we do about anyone else. Now, I could probably preach a sermon or two or three or ten on this one topic alone, but I want to stay focused here. I want to make sure we're, we're paying attention to this particular passage. And in this passage, it's about that freedom to eat meat that might have been used as a sacrifice. And I want to be sure that we're clear on this because one of the problems with this discussion is that it is kind of following this tension between what is unclear and what is clear, what is unknown and what is known. You see, Paul is, has already basically said in, in previous verses that we didn't read that if you know meat was sacrificed to an idol, you should not eat it. You'd be participating in something that you, you shouldn't be doing, that, that, that goes against what God would call you to do. But the issue, Paul is telling us, is not about meat in and of itself. It, it's not about just simply this idea that you have eaten, the question is, is that if you knew that this meat was sacrificed to an idol, most likely you're either at the temple where it's being sacrificed or you followed it along, which means you are basically worshiping at the altar of the same idol as the person who sacrificed the meat. And God doesn't want anything between us and him or in addition to him. Follow what I'm saying? We have to be careful. God doesn't want us to have idols. Paul tells us something very specific. You can eat any meat that has been purchased in a market. Now, we should assume that some of the meat that was offered in the Corinthian market was most likely had been come from one of these temples, and, and you just don't know which is which. When you go down to the, to, the, to the store, I don't know whether you like Walmart or Fry's or Sam's Club or Albertsons, but when you go down there, can you be sure that none of the meat that they are selling was used in some sort of a, a, a ritual from some other religion? They wouldn't mark it, would they? Hey, we've, uh, we've got a farmer that's a little bit, uh, he's weird in his religious beliefs, so he sacrifices all of his cows in a certain way, and this meat is from him. Right? They would never tell you that. They would say, look, It's ground beef. Do you want it or not? Where did it come from? The farmer. The cow. You see, I think one of the the challenges is that we, we have this idea that we want to be sure because we really do want to serve God. But there is no absolute assurity that we will be doing what we need to do. We have to begin to to funnel that through what God is telling us specifically. I think that's a a bit of a challenge. Maybe part of the issue that the Corinthian church was facing was that since we couldn't know for sure, maybe we should avoid it altogether. That you don't eat meat that was bought at a market because it may have been used. And other people saying, well, we're free because it's just meat. It's not necessarily that we're participating. And Paul is saying, absolutely, you go ahead. It doesn't matter if it was used in a sacrifice because unless you're hoping for that, You're good. You're golden. You can give God thanks. In fact, what he says is that the Lord created everything, and everything created by the Lord is good. You don't seem at all excited about this. If you had been a Jew, you'd have been especially excited to find out that the Lord created everything, and everything is good, because now you could have all the bacon you want. There, now I got you a little excited. 
You see, there's, there's a thing about food, right? Food really doesn't have the power to bring us closer to God. Like, all by itself, food doesn't really bring us closer to God. It can be something that we give extra thanks for because when we're eating, we realize how good God is to us. But it doesn't necessarily, in and of itself, bring us closer to God. Food might have some power to take us away from God if we love food more than we love God. But when it comes to this idea of meat sacrificed to idols, one of the things Paul is saying is that it's meat. God created the cow or the whatever, so it must be okay. Do you agree? Say amen or something. Come on. Nobody's eyes are closed yet, but some of you look like you might be sleeping with them open. This leaves a lot of personal, uh, personal freedom for us. So Paul is saying, look, If God is the one who created the meat, you are okay to eat it. As long as you receive it with gratitude, not to any kind of idol, but to God. All right, now I got one of you with me. Paul expresses a freedom to eat any meat as well that is offered in the house of an unbeliever. I mean, you got to be kind of clear here, right? If somebody invited you over for dinner and you know they're not a Christ follower and you are pretty sure that they are coming right from the temple where they probably sacrifice the meat they're about to feed you, you probably are going to politely decline their offer to come over, right? But if you show up and they happen to put out some meat in front of you, you shouldn't begin to ask questions in order to find out if you should be taking offense at the fact that they are serving you something that you aren't supposed to be eating. You see, it just kind of stirs up controversy for the sake of controversy. Paul is saying, hey, God made the meat, so if you don't know that it's come from altar, uh, from, from an altar of an idol, just assume that it is good. Give God thanks for it and enjoy. You wouldn't know if this was done unless someone tells you, so Paul addresses that as well. He, he says, if you have been told that it was in a sacrifice, don't eat it, but otherwise, you're okay. There's a lot, thing, a lot that we could be, be said here, but Paul is sort of telling us one of the things that we need to be careful of is going into the home, and particularly the home of a non-believer. When he says this, he's talking about non-believers specifically. But when we go into the home of a non-believer, our first thing should not be to go look at things to take offense at. We shouldn't be getting all upset because something offends our our conscience. We should just simply accept the the fact that God has allowed us to come into this place and whatever they feed us is okay. I, I think that's important for us to pay attention to. It's not okay to participate if they're saying, hey, look, come on over. We're gonna have a little seance and I would love for you to be a part of that. You should say no. If you get there and they go, oh, we're so glad you're here. It's time to start the seance. You probably should leave. But if you're looking to find out if they had seances and you're starting to peek in their drawers, stop it. It's not the kind of thing you ought to be doing. You see, the, the challenge of this, one of the things that's the, that a lot of the scholars speak to and, and they go through this is they're like, look, it's not the host normally that's going to say, hey, well, I just got this meat. I brought it. it was, I, I sacrificed it to the God of whatever. Most likely, the person that's going to tell you this is like a servant who knows that you're a Christ follower and knows that they are not, who, who knows that you might want to keep yourself pure. And, and so because of that, they would warn you that you might be eating something that you probably shouldn't. They're, they're basically trying to save you from being embarrassed later. I mean, imagine what would happen is if you went into somebody's house, ate meat, sacrificed to idols, and of course, in today's day and age, they would have recorded everything, right? They would have video of you going into the house and eating that sacrificed meat, and when you went to run for president, everybody would know, and it would disqualify you. What kind of Christian are you? You ate sacrificed meat, even though you didn't know it at the time, right? Right? One of the things Paul is very clear about is that choosing not to eat meat is less a matter of the meat and more a matter of the message. So here's kind of what he's saying. Paul created the meat, or Paul says God created the meat. So whatever the meat is, 
take it, thank God, and eat it. Use it to nourish your body. But if you know that there's a reason not to eat the meat, don't. Not because it's going to harm you as much as it might harm the person that told you, watch out, that meat over there was sacrificed to an idol. You need to stay away from it, not because you're not allowed to exercise your right that way, but because you want to send the right message to somebody else. Now, I want you to think a little bit about this. This is one area where we have become extremely legalistic sometimes in our current day and age. Well, not so much, but, uh, but when I first became part of the Church of the Nazarene, there was still this big stigma of all the things you couldn't do lest God get in and not be able to do anything with you, and, and Satan would just have you by the, by the ears. We need to be careful of going down to that, but we also need to know that if somebody mentions to us, hey, you might want to watch out for this, that they're a little bit worried for us, and we should honor what they're trying to tell us. You see, Paul's really saying that this is a matter of honoring the other person of doing for them what they ought to do. He speaks of conscience, and when you think of conscience, one of the things is that you really bear, boil it down. It becomes an issue of you knowing right from wrong. And so somebody else feeling like this is right from wrong, they warn you, and you are trying to help them understand that they should not be eating meat from an idol lest they follow in your footsteps. And you're like, you know, you take your first bite and you're like, well, this is really tasty. And somebody pokes you and they say, hey, you know that they just got this from the temple? They had just sacrificed this? And you're like, yeah, but it's bacon and it's delicious? <laughs> what you're telling them is, well, it didn't matter, did it? Paul's saying, honor the other person. It's less about you, more about them in this particular case. Show them the example that they ought to follow. And by the way, a little later, Paul's going to say, I'm trying to give you the example that Jesus gave me to follow so that you will follow my example. You see, in this case, the reality is that idols and idol worship is not the way to go. But as much as all that is concerned, what's even more important is that if somebody else tells you that, hey, this meat was, it's probably not what you'd want to be eating, that you would honor them as well. Paul also goes on, he doesn't just leave it there, but he appears to sort of defend his freedom from the people who want to return to a legalistic ideal. Now, I don't want to get myself in trouble here, and I, I, I might, I don't know. But basically, what he's saying is this freedom that you guys are also worried about is a freedom that I have too. But Paul is a leader within the church, and so what probably would happen is any time that somebody could do exactly what I told you, that little example I gave you earlier, and say, well, Paul didn't care what, he, what meat he eats. He just says, well, it's food, thank the Lord, and starts eating. Who cares if it was an idol or who cares if it wasn't? And I think he says, listen, this idea of that the Lord has given it to is greater than any other issue than you could imagine. Anything else that you could cook up. You see, one of the problems within the Christian world, and I think this was true back in the time of Paul, I think it's true today, is that it is so easy to begin to snipe at other Christians, at leaders, at those who you maybe don't agree with all the time. And so what ends up happening is that we end up starting to pick at other people. And why do you think Jesus would say something like, hey, um, you see that, that dust you are talking about in somebody else's eye? Have you noticed the plank in your own? I think that's an important thing to, to remember, even as part of this whole Christian freedom. You basically have the right to say anything you want. But is that a good thing? Is that something that's going to help? One of the things that Paul is very clear at when he writes is that he had a lot of faults. He had a lot of flaws. He had a lot of things going for him, but he's not unaware of the fact that he's not perfect. And so he really kind of tells us that his heart is in a real place as an imperfect person, that his whole thing is not to figure out whether or not meat is sacrificed to an idol or not when there's no way of really knowing. His whole idea is that God gets glorified. 
through him, through what he's doing. I think that's probably why he says, the verse we ended it with, verse 31, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Paul is saying, and I think we would would say, or would at least want to say, we are imperfect people, but we want to glorify God. Now, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit uh, personal here. I'm going to talk about us for a second. We all have gathered together, whether it's your first time, whether you've been coming here for 312 years. We have gathered together this morning. And here's one of the things that I know happens almost every Sunday after church. People leave and they get into their cars and they go to wherever they're going to go and they sit down and they usually have somebody else with them and, and sometimes it's somebody who's been here, sometimes it's somebody who hasn't and, and we begin to sort of pick apart what happened in church. We start to worry about all of the really super important matters of the church like it was too hot, it was too cold. And by the way, some of you think it's too hot right now, some of you think it's too cold. It was too bright, it was too dark. I didn't like the color of the background, I loved the color of the background. The preacher was really confusing, the preacher was really good. The musicians were really good. The, the, the one that was on the one end or the other might have uh, looked like they weren't really in it today. And the other one, maybe one of the ones in the middle, wasn't quite on key. And I really hate when we sing Amazing Grace because I have heard it too many times. Some of you will leave this place and that will be the topic of conversation over your lunch. Now you all are going to be like, if he has a, a microphone, we're in trouble. <laughs> so you begin to snipe at the church. You begin to snipe at the pastor. There's something I want you to, t- want, want you to know and, and to fully understand. The church is not the building. I am not a paid servant that works in the building to keep you happy. We, all of us, are the church. And if the building were to disappear all around us right now, and you were all suddenly sitting on the floor, and I was just standing on the grass and shouting at you, what I felt like God wanted me to say, you are the church. So think about it for a minute. When you pick at any part of this church, you are picking at yourself. You want to talk about how somebody didn't live up to your standards or something didn't live up to your standards? <laughs> you know, the whole thing, you know, point at me and three pointing back at you, you know, kind of thing. It's impossible for you. And this is part of, I think, what Paul's getting at here. When we become legalistic about what God wants us to do, we begin to, to start to snipe at other people. And in this case, Paul probably has been sniped at about all kinds of things. And so he's like, when it comes to eating meat, I don't care. Somebody puts food in front of me, I don't go, hey, where did you get this from? Because, you know, people are watching me. And if they find out that I didn't get this from the right sources, oh boy, He says, God made it all. Thank you, Lord. I I love you, Lord. And great, I'm thankful for bacon. What's most important to consider when you're exercising Christian freedom? I'm going to go through a bunch of issues before I get to my answer. So you're going to have to pay close attention. and, And very few of these are actually in your notes. Actually, none of them. I want you to be very careful because when we have Christian freedom, the power of evil and the lure, lure, the lure of idols wanting to dethrone God is very real. When you begin to serve God, there are going to be all kinds of other things that come to you and begin to say, look, I want you to be a part of me. And, and God is going to be okay with it or God doesn't really need to even be part of the picture. Anything that detracts from God's being number one in your life opens the door to evil. 
Keep that in mind. That's one of the things I think Paul's trying to get to us. There's a need for spiritual self-discipline from all of us. I want you to understand that it's very precarious. If you go into somebody's house and they're like, hey, I just sacrificed this meat to an idol. Here, eat up. You probably ought to step away just because you may begin to become desensitized and soon be following that same evil. I want, or I want you to understand that you become what you worship. Think about this for a minute. When you worship something, you participate in it, you share it, and the object of your worship is what you are going to become. So if it is God, if it is Jesus, you will become whatever it is that you're worshiping. People will be able to see it. People will be able to to notice it. The The right use of freedom has responsibilities of privilege that we need to be paying attention to. And remember that you are an example to others. They're looking at you to find out what it looks like to live with God. And so be sure that you are putting love as the number one thing. How do you love best? Now, the question was, what is most important to consider when exercising Christian freedom? I've just given you a whole bunch of things I wanted you to be aware of. How about this answer? The most important consideration when exercise Christian freedom is the benefit of the action. You see, I want you to think in terms of the eating meat sacrificed to idols. Now, that's not really a big deal in today's society, but if you were to, to stop and think of all the different things that are something that we might be talking about. You need to be able to consider your benefits, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, before you take a particular action, say a specific thing, eat a certain whatever. It doesn't matter if you're free to do it. I want to give you some questions that you should be asking yourself before you make an action. This would be true of almost anything that you're thinking about doing that you're starting to wonder. Is this like meat sacrificed to idols and eating it? Is it clear or is it not clear? The question is that if it's not clear, ask yourself first, is it a benefit to me? Is it a benefit to you to do whatever it is that you are thinking of doing? There's a couple of sort of side rules to that. There should be no effect on your relationship with God as a result of what you're about to do or what you're doing. If it is getting in the way of your relationship with God in any way, shape, or form, the answer is don't do it. The second thing is is that your choices, your decisions, your exercising of your Christian freedom cannot dominate you. What happens is if you become dependent on it, you may find yourself depending on something other than God. And that's not a good place for anyone to be. The other thing is that it shouldn't harm you mentally, physically, be a poor use of your time, your talent, your treasure. Really think about whether or not it's benefiting you in your relationship with God. The second thing that I would tell you that you should be asking before you decide to exercise Christian freedom is, is it a benefit to those who are around you? Your actions should build other people up, not tear them down. When I say when you snipe within the church, you're sniping at yourself. Remember that every person in this room, there is not a single one of you, at least as far as I'm aware, that is not human. And what I do know is that none of you are perfect. I'm not, you're not, we're not. So one of the things we have to realize is that what we do needs to build other people up. And look, if there is a thing that you know is going to tear somebody down and get them away from God, you need to choose not to do that thing so that they will be able to to be where God wants them to be. One of the things is, is that whatever you do should invite others to enjoy the presence of God through you, right? So if you're making a decision that's going to keep other people from being able to really enjoy being in God's presence, you have an issue in your hand. The third question I would ask you to ask, you know, is it a benefit to you? Is it a benefit to others? But is it a benefit in glorifying God through you? God's glory should be evident in your life. Not because you're great at following rules, but because you are so connected with God that others can see it, you reflect him to the people around you. That's the way it ought to be. 
Your actions should reflect God and what God would like for us to live, the ways he would like for us to live, and it should reflect him in all of his glory. There should be a lot of forgiveness. There should be a lot of love. There should be a lot of redemption. There should be a lot of transformation. We should be so excited for one another and how God is working in each other's lives that we can't help but to be excited about what God is doing not only in us but in everybody else. When was the last time you looked around and you said, we're all on a journey towards God and isn't it exciting? My guess is, It's been a while, and partly because we're not looking for it. We don't tend to share. We don't want you to know that anything's wrong between me and God. That's why sometimes the altars are not a very popular place, because it's supposed to be a place where you can really connect with God and just kind of bow before the throne. But if we go there, something must be really wrong. Right? Because we have an issue. The first thing we do is we try to fix it. The second thing we do is we try to fix it some more. And then, if that doesn't work, we finally go, well, maybe we ought to pray about it. And I suppose if it's really bad, we ask somebody else to pray about it. And if it's still bad after that, well, might as well leave this church. There's no power here. You see what I'm trying to say? We should be reflecting the Lord. We should be talking to one another. We should be doing things that build one another up. And then we should also be sure that our decisions don't tarnish the good name and the glory of God. You see, sometimes we get ourselves into things that get us away from his glory and actually send people a message that God is no different than just living in the world. Why do people not want to come to church? Well, it seems like we have a bunch of rules. But what have I said this whole time? The rules are love one another. The rules are give God thanks for it. Yes, there are things that you shouldn't do. Don't have idols before God. You know, go back through the Ten Commandments. It's ten rules, people. Things like don't kill one another. Things like consider God most important. With all of that, are you free to do anything except? There's a part of me that says, oh, of course you're free to do anything you want. Except before you do whatever it is that you want to do, you had better make sure that you've been able to answer these three questions. How did Paul start that whole thing off? You say that you have rights. But just because you can do something, does that make it good? Does that make it a benefit? And unfortunately, the answer most of the time might be no. Lord, this morning we've been looking at a passage of your word and Lord, I just struggle with this sometimes because I I feel like there are so many ways when we as a church, as individuals, want to have the legalism because it seems easier and that we don't always recognize that the freedom that we have in you is a freedom to live so in in touch with you, so in, in communication with you, so near to you that the rules don't really make the difference that our freedom is to do whatever we can to love one another to build one another up and to get closer to you so lord this morning i i would ask that we not take this as something that we need to do legally like in a legalism way but that we would truly begin to ask ourselves some questions things like are what we doing is it building other people up Is it helping other people to grow closer to you? Is it helping other people to connect with you? Because if it's not, Lord, we are being a a, a blemish on your good image. And we certainly don't want that. So this week, Lord, I ask that you'd remind us of these questions, that you'd remind us of these truths, that you'd give us the opportunity to be able to live them out, that we would recognize that there's things that we have the right to do, 
Certainly no one's trying to stop us. But that are not a benefit, a benefit primarily to you and to your glory. Help us to remove those things from our lives. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you'd keep us safe until we have the opportunity to worship you once again. All God's people said,